reading from the prophet Isaiah. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Of those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as a people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of the oppressor. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The word of the Lord. One of my favorite stories, and I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard this from me before, is about a little boy going upstairs with his mother. He's tucked into bed, and, and, and they say their evening prayers. And as she's leaving the room, he, she turns out the light. And he says, Mommy, Mommy, t turn on the light, turn on the light. And the little boy, and she says, why? What's wrong? She says, I'm afraid of the dark. She says, well, don't be worried. God is with you. And he says, well, I want a God with skin. And actually, that's what we have in the birth of Christ, isn't it? A God with skin, a God who has visited our earth and come to dwell with us. I read about some churches who do weird things so they can make sure the meaning of Christmas. There's one Lutheran church in the Midwest that celebrates Christmas at June because they figure that way people won't be distracted with all the shopping and all the decorations and the Santa Clauses. Another church had the beginning of Mass at the, at the, the vigil Mass, the night of, night of Christmas, as the, the priests and, and, and ministers processed in, behind them was Santa Claus. And Santa Claus simply went up to the major scene and kissed the forehead of Jesus, bowed, and, and walked out just so they could make a connection with all the e extra kind of stuff that we seem to have all around us. Well, we're not going to celebrate Christmas in uh, June here. We will stay with December, but we hope that we'll be able to stay focused on, on, on what this all means for us. By way of introduction, I want to say we're going to talk about what we believe, and, and we, we profess that every Sunday when we say the creed, I believe. But the what is not as important as the why. What does it mean? And why do we believe it? Why does it make sense in our lives to profess that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, became flesh, but was truly God? So as I go through the, catech catech the catechism that we were reading for this, this month, I will also try to say, why do we believe it? Why does it make sense? The context for this whole thing is to recognize that God so loved the word, as they say in John, 16, John 3, Verse 16, and it's, I don't know why we see it at football games, but uh, God so loved the world that God sent God's only Son, Son to us, to become one like us. This is a God who hears the cry of the poor. All through the Old Testament, we hear the people in the desert moaning and grumbling that they don't have anything to eat. We hear them beforehand moaning about being slaves and trapped in Egypt. 
God hears the cry of those who call out and God saves them. God lifts them up. God raises them up. We also hear that God takes delight in the people. God's basic stance is one of love, one of compassion for each and every one of us, one of care, and one who weeps when we are weeping, who hears us. And then this is finalized, this covenant promise is finalized in offering Christ his son, one just like us, on the earth. So that, in the incarnation of Christ in our world, heaven and earth are joined together by a bond that can never be broken. And this is important for, for our faith because our faith isn't in something in the future. It's not something distant. Our faith is in a God who is present to us. And that's why it makes sense to, to worship, pray, gather in God's name, to act in God's name. One of the first things that we hear in the, as we discuss the incarnation, is that in the early centuries, there was a lot of debate about whether Christ was truly God or, and truly man at the same time. You have to admit, it's, it's, it seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? That God, Christ would be fully man and fully, excuse me, fully human and fully God at the same time. But all throughout, St. Anselm, St. Ambrose, whose feast we just celebrated, all affirmed this to be the case because people were questioning it. Some said, for example, um, that Christ was just a human, just joined to God in some way, kind of like we are joined to God, maybe. And the Gnostics said that when Christ entered into human form, the human form disappeared. Another, some other people said that, that only Christ's will was divine. Another critic said that Christ was divine by nature, not by adoption. It doesn't matter all these, what they call at that time, heresies. They don't do that anymore. There's still people who believe some of this. But what difference does it make? What difference does it make that God, or Christ, excuse me, is fully human and fully divine at the same time? It makes a difference because if God is, if Christ is only partially God or partially human, he's not like us. We're only getting a piece of who God is. We're only getting some small part or some glimpse. And so to affirm that God, Christ is fully human and fully God offers us a complete relationship with God in Christ. There's no, nothing left over. There's nothing we have to wait for. Um, there's nothing, no loose edges. You see what I mean? In this relationship that we have. St. Albert the Great, who's quoted in the, in the catechism, said, for what is better than God manifesting God's whole sweetness to us? You gave them bread from heaven, not the fruit of human labor, but a bread endowed with all delight and pleasant to every sense of taste. For this substance of yours revealed your kindness towards your children, and serving the desire of each recipient, it changed to see each one's taste. So each of us has the fullness, has the opportunity for a full and complete relationship with God through Christ, because God, because Christ is fully human and fully God not just the peace. And what's even more wonderful, and the rite of initiation for adults affirms this, that God's grace touches each one of us in a unique way. So no two of us are alike in the relationship we have with Christ. 
The only thing that it's like, it's, it's a full relationship with Christ who is both human and divine. Why did God do this, though? Why did God send Christ into the world to save us? For one, God did this to overcome original sin. Humans, we call them Adam and Eve, the first Adam, were living in a paradise, but they separated themselves from God in some way. We talk about eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge, but it could have happened in any way. They separated themselves from God, and God felt that separation, cast them out of the Garden of Eden. Somehow Eden is a lot of crossword puzzles. But, uh, and God sent his only son, the new Adam, who could restore that relationship who could restore that relationship with us. Another sign that God is constantly reaching out to those who have fallen. As original, as people, people born on the earth were already kind of, were separated from God in some way. Uh, we don't experience that life of God until we share in the baptism. When we are baptized, when we die with Christ and rise to share life. Only the divine, though, can accomplish this reconciliation. Those who separated themselves, humans, we can't get back on our own. We need God's help and God's grace. And so it makes a difference that God initiated this incarnation because it brings us into the light into the light, the light of Christ. And that's why I read the reading from Isaiah. The light comes as a son is given to us, a Messiah, a prince, the Prince of Peace. We, we become, and St. Athanasius says it in, in the Catechism, God became human so that humans could become God. Very plain and simple. So that we can become God. Now, I will say, when I was talking with the catechists, they wondered, really? We're, we, are we? It seems strange that we think of ourselves as gods. While we're on earth, we're actually broken gods. And we won't be fully gods until we are united with Christ in the heavenly kingdom. Then we will be fully united with God, we'll be so united we'll, we'll be gods. In the meantime, we're broken gods or we become God-like, is probably a better word. So we become God-like in our journey through life as we grow in faith, as we grow in, in the mind of Christ. St. Leo the Great said this, no one is shut out from this joy. All share the same reason for rejoicing, our Lord, Victory over sin and death, finding no one free from sin, came to free us all. Let the saints rejoice as, as he sees the palm of victory at hand. Let sinners be glad as they receive the offer of forgiveness. And let the pagans, pagans take courage as they also are summoned to life. So it's an invitation to all of us to share in God's life, no matter who we are or what religion we belong to. He did it so that we could experience God's love in the most intimate of ways, through each other, through, through, through our prayer. We could experience in our flesh God. So that love is not an abstract quality that we share. It's not something that we will achieve only when we die, but that divine love is experienced in our flesh. One example of probably the most pre uh, common to us is in the sacrament of marriage. When a man and a woman become one flesh, when they mirror together the love of God. 
But that's, that's a sacrament of the church, of course. There are hundreds and hundreds of ways we, we can experience God's love. We experience God's love perhaps when we're at church, but perhaps when we're reaching out and touching someone who is in need. We're experiencing God's love when somebody offers a comforting arm or shoulder that we can cry on. We experience God's love in all those fleshy, down-to-earth kinds of ways. And that's why God came to earth so that we would have that experience of God's love and not have to wait for it until we die. St. Leo the Great also wrote down, remember your dignity, Christian, and now that you share in God's own nature, do not return to sin to your former base connection. Do not forget that you have been rescued from the power of darkness and brought into the light of God's kingdom. And these words are important because, because we're human. And it's natural that we're going to fail at times or perhaps sin in some way. But we never have to lose hope. No matter how guilty we may feel, no matter how saddened we may be or heartbroken by our failures, God does not stop looking upon us with a smile, with gladness, with an offer of forgiveness each and every time. And we remember, I think, when Jesus said, "Forgiving, we forgive our brothers and sisters 70 times seven, over and over. That's how God is with us. And that's why we don't get bogged down in our, in our failures or in our, our weaknesses, because we know that God offers us a new way to go, a new way in which to move. He sent his son to provide for us a model of holiness, to provide for us a model of holiness so that we could see Jesus in the flesh ministering to people. And how is that holiness revealed? It's revealed in Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. It's spelled out in a beautiful way in the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who weep. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who, who are little children. Blessed are those who are filled with life. We become, the mod Jesus becomes the new norm for our lives. And at the center, as you know, at the center of the covenant, the law, if you will, is the command to love God with heart, soul, and mind, and for our sake, most importantly, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Because when we do that, that's when we encounter God. We're not trying to reach some divine person, but we're looking upon the people we see and we find in each face Christ. Christ alive in them. There was a story a, a, a rabbi told about um, having a, a, school, a class of school children. And he, one day he asked them, when you look out on the fields, what do you, what do you see? What, what, what do you see? And one of the little boy raised his hands and says, I can, I can see, what, what do you see? As, as it gets lighter, as, excuse me, I'm messing up the story. What, what do you see when, when the sun comes up? What do you see out in the fields? And a little boy said, I can tell the difference between the goats and the cows. And he said, no, that's not it. And, and a little girl waved her hand while she said, I know, I know. She said, I can, I can tell the difference when I see the orchard, I can tell the difference between the, the apple trees and the fig trees when the light has come. And he said, no, the light has come when we can look into the eyes of any man, woman, or child and realize that that person is our brother or sister. 
then the light has come. And it doesn't have to be a Catholic or a Christian. <coughs> it applies on every level that God has come. <coughs> so we become sharers in God's divine nature. And how do we do that? We do that by a constant process of conversion so that in our lifetimes, we become in our hearts, our affect, our feelings, attuned to the heart of Christ. And that's why one of the reasons why in medieval times, the, the, the worship or the devotion to the sacred heart developed. Why? Because it was in a medieval time when people were separated from church. They went to Mass and they just watched as all this stuff happened in front of them, like, like magic almost, and speaking in Latin so they couldn't understand. The reason they rang bells was because people would run to the church at the time of the Eucharist. Simply they could see the Eucharist. They felt so distant. And they developed piety practices of piety so that they could experience a closeness to Christ that they were not experiencing at, at Mass. They weren't even allowed to experience it at Mass. We grow in our hearts to, to, that we can feel and sense a, a grow in a life of virtue, if you will. We grow in the midst of the church. We grow. We grow so that we become a community not only are we individuals are each of us a body of Christ, but we are a body of Christ as a unit with different gifts, with different skills, with different ways we bring life to the world. St. Thomas wrote this. He said, the only begotten Son of God wanting to make us sharers in God's divinity, assumed our nature, made human, so that, might, so that all humans might become gods. And that, again, is in the Catechism, too, uh, quoted in the Catechism. But that's there's a difference. None of them say become God-like, but that's because they're talking about in the final end, when we are joined with God in heaven. But even now, so that we, each of us, has the capacity to become God-like. Each of us has the capacity to be mirrors of God. There have been different explanations through the ages, but, and, and you're familiar with the term transubstantiation. This was all Greek philosophy, and we don't, we don't think in that ways, but it was that, Bread, bread and wine are accidents, but the body and blood of Christ is the substance. So substance, the accidents are different than the substance. So it's, so it's kind of the same way with our bodies. We, we can't explain how. We try to explain how it happens, but we might see our, our bodies are simply like an accident. And when they say accident, it doesn't mean like falling off a chair or getting into a car crash. An accident was a physical thing. But but the sub our substance, as, as Christ became one substance in his humanity, substantiate, substantiated by the, through his birth in the Virgin Mary, we too grow in body, in mind, in heart, soul, and will. We grow and we show by our lives that it's possible for divine life to become visible on this earth. What a great opportunity. What, how, how, how terrific this is. We grow in wisdom and stature, just like Jesus did at the, uh, at the hands of the, of the Blessed Mother. It's interesting, I found in the Catechism that they, they tell us that Mary, Jesus' first teacher of prayer was through his mother and through his parents. That they taught him as a young child how to pray. I don't know exactly how they know that, but I think that's, be, that's because 
the way we speak of Jesus growing in stature and wisdom. So just like Christ, we spend our lifetimes growing in wisdom, confidence, and grace. It could all happen the moment we are plunged in baptism. But it would be wonderful, but, our, but, but unrealistic. When people were baptized in the early church, they, they, they affirmed that they lived in the spirit of Christ, that they were going to stay faithful. But then what happened? Then they started to fall into sin, those who were baptized. And at first, the church, church leaders were astounded. How can these people be sinning? How can this be happening? They were baptized. What went wrong? Nothing went wrong. It's that though we were baptized, though we were given the opportunity to become God-like, at times they failed. And so they started to think about if people are separated from God in some way, and that's what it, sin is about, being separated from God, is there some way we can restore that separation? That's where the sacrament, excuse me, the sacrament of reconciliation came about through that willingness to, to assume that though, they were, though we are baptized, we can have opportunities to be reconciled with God in, in, in some way. So, in essence, what this means for us is that we enter into a relationship with Christ. The Catechism says, faith in Christ requires being in a personal relationship with Christ. A relationship that we experience in our relationship with other people. And a better way of saying it, I think, than the catechism, <laughs> sorry to say that, is that the Word of God inspires us or invites us to respond. And in our liturgies, that's what we do. We go through, it's a dialogue that we are having with God as a community. Where we hear God's word, we respond with a psalm. Where we say a prayer, we respond with a, 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 an amen. We respond with giving thanks. We respond all throughout the liturgy. We hear an invitation to come to the table and we respond by coming up and sharing in Holy Communion. Where the priest or minister says, body of Christ, referring not only to a piece of bread, but referring to you and me, referring to each of us as the body of Christ. We're echoing what St. Augustine said when, what St. Augustine said when, when he was speaking about communion, and he says, become what you receive. Become what you receive. And we sing about that too in, in, in a number of our songs. So that ongoing conversion we experience with life is experienced on, on, on three important levels. It's a, I already spoke about being united with the heart of Christ. But that means growing in the virtues that we hear about in the gospel. That this Sunday we will hear about in the reading from Isaiah, for example. Growing in that, but also becoming attuned to the mind of Christ thinking like Christ. We're seeing the world in the way Christ sees people. Seeing the way Christ looked upon the poor or the lonely or the isolated or even sinners or those that were considered sinners, unfortunately, and looking on them with love and compassion and recognizing the faith that they have. And in concert with the hands of Christ, with the will of Christ that works, that does good deeds as an expression of our faith. This is the way we enter into a personal relationship with Christ. It's something we have to dive into. Dive into, not be afraid, not be fearful of what might happen to come. 
This little story from a Zen master talks about the Zen master gave a woman a sieve and a cup, and they went to a nearby seashore where they stood on a rock with the bra waves breaking around them. And he said, show me how you will fill this sieve with water. And she took a cup, a quart, and as she poured it in, the water kept coming out of the bottom of the sieve. There wasn't any water. And she kept trying again and again, trying to fill it as fast as she could so she could catch it before it would disappear. He took the sieve from her hand and he threw it far out into the sea where it floated momentarily and then it sank. Now it is full of water, he said, and it will remain so. That's the way to fill it with water. And it's the way to do spiritual practice. If not labeling little cupfuls of divine, ladling little cupfuls of divine life into our lives, little pieces here and there. But it's plunging into the sea. Our entire personality becomes complete and filled with that life. And that is what gives us power. That is what gives us grace. That is how we become signs. Sometimes people are afraid of taking that extra leap that will fill them with God's love and compassion. But everything points from the teachers in the early church to the present day that with God, all things are possible for us.